Hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And again, on behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We will, Amen. We will be continuing on in our study of the prophet Amos. Yes. And uh, in our last study, we finished up the second chapter, so we'll be starting at chapter 3, verse 1. And as you're getting prepared for that, I want to just ask the Lord, Father, Lord, that you would that you would open the ears, dig out our ears, open the eyes of our hearts, and we would see wonderful things in your word and grow in understanding. Lord, that as you spoke to these people, to these people of yours in Israel, as a last day's message for them, let us come to see that it's a last day's message for us. Lord, help us to hear what your spirit is saying to us, what your spirit is saying to the church, that we might grow in understanding and in knowledge and couple that with the wisdom which your spirit gives us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay? Okay. Okie dokie. Here we go then. Amos chapter 3, verse 1. Hear this word which the Lord has spoken against you, sons of Israel, against the entire family which he brought up from the land of Egypt. It's pretty sad that God has to be speaking to all of his people. They came out of it, right? The entire family of God. Yes. You see, we should desperately desire that the Lord speak to us, to speak to us for building up our faith, which comes by hearing him. Mm -hmm. And of course, without faith, it's impossible to please him. So as Paul wrote to Timothy, we, we need to hear his voice for teaching, for reproving, for correcting us. You know, it says in Proverbs, uh, you know, it says it many times in Proverbs, but I'm going to just read two verses. Proverbs 3.11 says, My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. This is for reproof. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. That's the word of God, Proverbs 12.1. The Lord speaks to us for instruction and training in righteousness. Yes? Yes. <clears throat> but even now as we study, I am confident that the Lord God is speaking to us through the prophet Amos for us to grow and mature in him. To continue to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Mm -hmm. The Lord is speaking through Amos for us. Hallelujah. For this day. However, however, it says he was speaking against mm. the sons of Israel when he sent the prophet Amos. Not for, but against. Rebuking? But, but I just want to use that word. He's, you know, if God is for us, who can be against, against us? us? But look, it's a sad situation when God is the one against us, yes. right? He was, a, he was speaking against the sons of Israel because... Of their disobedience to his commands. To the word that he had already spoken to them since they were let out of bondage in, in Egypt, right? right? He is speaking his word against them. You know, it, it is our calling to engage in spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. But that's against our adversary, the devil. Not to get into an unwinnable battle with the Lord our God. As it is written in Isaiah 45, verse 9, Woe to him who quarrels with his maker. When the Lord is speaking to you, pray that the Lord speak to you. Pray, I'm praying that the Lord speak to us today and to you today. But may he be speaking for us, not against us. Because we have a heart to receive discipline and receive correction, okay? In, chap in verse 2 of that third chapter, he says, You only have I chosen among all the families of the earth. Therefore, oh, that sounds like a wonderful thing, right? That's a wonderful thing. <laughs> Out of all of the families of the earth, I've chosen you. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Whoa. You see, it's, it's all the more perilous here because, as Jesus said, from whom much has been given, much is, much required. is required. Those Israelites had been chosen by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They had been called of God. 
delivered by God to be his people set apart from the world. And as such, they incur, strict we incur a stricter judgment. Why did God pick them? Well, let me read that to you. Deuteronomy chapter 7, I'm going to read verses 6 to 8. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. This is God speaking to the Israelites, right? The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the other people. For you the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he had sworn to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He keeps his promises. He watches over his word to perform it. He made a promise to Abraham, right? He is faithful and he yeah. never fails. Never fails. The Lord knew that this people, his people, would be the fewest, outnumbered at every turn. And to make certain, as with Gideon, he would even reduce the size of the Hebrew army as they prepared to fight the Midianites. Mm -hmm. Right? Judges 7 2, it says, And the Lord said to Gideon, yes. The people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian into their hands. Lest Israel become boastful, saying, yes, My own power has delivered me. Mm -hmm. Judges 7 2. You see, didn't Jesus teach us to pray to the Father, saying, For thine is the glory? In 1 Corinthians 1, I'm going to read verses 25 to 9. The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised, God has chosen. He's chosen the things that are not, that he might nullify the things that are. That no man should boast before God. For thine is the glory. Even salvation. It says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one should boast. For thine is the glory. Not to us, O Lord. Not to us, but to thy name give glory. Psalm 115, 1. In Isaiah 42, 8, listen. God said, I am the Lord. That is my name. I am Yahweh. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another. And Paul wrote to the Corinthians again, 2 Corinthians 10, 17. And he said, but he who boasts, let him boast in the Lord. Yes, see, we're to boast in and glorify our God and Father. And so Paul prayed for the brethren, for the believers. In Romans 15, I'm going to read 5 and 6. Here's what he prayed. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another, right? Mm -hmm. According to Christ Jesus, that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For thine is the glory. Amen. We, we need to make sure that we understand this and have this straight. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're quarreling with your maker, and it's a battle you can't win. Our lives on this planet in these times have purpose. God has purpose for us being here. Peter wrote this. I, I wish I, I should sing it, but I won't. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you may show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That you can that you can show forth his praises. For thine be the glory. Our lives on this planet in these times are not about our jobs, not about our houses, 
not about our cars, unless you understand that those things and those places are about what Paul wrote in his letter to the church at Corinth. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in his triumph in Christ, and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. 2 Corinthians 2, 14 and 15. You don't work to meet your needs. God has already promised to meet your needs through his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You go there to be an ambassador, to bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus. Bringing the knowledge of Christ Jesus into every place. For thine be the glory. Glorifying the Lord. But all of that said, you need to be, you need, we, may, we need to understand this. Sin in our lives hides the Lord. We're to be showing forth the Lord, but sin hides the Lord. And worse, and worse, again from Romans chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. You who boast in the law, we boast in the word, we're, we're, we're people of the word, right? Mm -hmm. Through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, mm -hmm. just as it is, re it is written. When we sin, we yes. give opportunity. Yes. We give opportunity to the unsaved to blaspheme God. That's not glorifying God. Mm -hmm. That's not glorifying our Lord. Think of the practices that we talked about in the last program, in the end of chapter 2, that were, the, were what was going on in Israel, that God had to send a prophet to them to expose their iniquity, right? I mean, it was horrible. Far from bringing glory to the Lord, they were giving opportunity to the outsiders to blaspheme the name, the name above all names, the only name given by which men can be saved, and thus they incurred a strict judgment. I mean, that's, that's the deal. This is not a game. This is serious stuff. And we need to be living for his glory. So we can, clearly, we can clearly see his just cause in speaking against those called to be his own people here in the time of Amos, right? With their sin, go read the end of chapter 2 again. He was just in, in sending Amos to bring his word to them. Yes. But woe to us if we do not take those words to heart in our times in these perilous last days. I said that the prophet Amos was a last days prophet. It was certainly the last days. Mm -hmm. This is a prophetic word to the end of the kingdom of Israel. But I want to tell you right now that this is a prophetic word to the end in our times. You'll see. There certainly have been too many scandals, all too many public displays of sin in recent times in the body of Christ that cause the unsaved to mock not just the church, but the God of the church. I mean, you know, it's hard to miss that. How many scandals there have been in the church, right? Right. All right, let's 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 move along. Zip right along to the next verse. Amos 3, 3. Do two men walk together unless they have made an appointment? Now, I, just, I read that from the New American Standard. But I, I really believe that the authorized version, the King James Version, and the New King James Version, much more accurately capture the spirit of what the Lord is saying. They both basically say, can two walk together unless they are agreed? Mm -hmm. Right? That, that translation would have us understand this question this way. In order to walk together, two, have to be, two people have to be in agreement. Right? Absolutely. What immediately came to my mind when I read this is that what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm reading verses 14, 15, and 16. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? What harmony has Christ with Belial, or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. We can't be, I mean, listen, we're, we're to be in the world, but not of it. Obviously, we're to love the unsaved. We're to, we're to share the gospel. 
But the fact of the matter is, if we're not in agreement, we're not going to be walking the same path. Because it's like, if, if we're not in the same state of mind as another person, like the oxen of unequal strength or unequal size, when they're locked together, they can't go in a straight line. They'll, they'll, you know, what happens is they'll keep going off. What's well, the same way? We're walking a path that is straight and narrow. And if you're walking that with somebody who is not spiritually right, they're going to pull you off. That's what Paul says. Listen, Paul says, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Bad company spoils good morals. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. I hear so many Christians say, listen, this certainly has to do with marriage. You know, well, we're, we're going to, he'll come and, you know, we'll be an influence. And, no. It, it is it's certainly a spiritual truth that you can see it's apparent that it is much more common that the weaker person will cause the stronger to go off the path of righteousness rather than the stronger keeping the weaker on that straight and narrow path. And that's why Paul said, don't be deceived, right? And the other absolute truth is that the people of God should be, are commanded to be, in agreement. Yes. Like-minded. No division. Have the same mind in you which was also in Christ Jesus, Philippians 2.5. So if I have the same mind as Christ, and you have the same mind of Christ, and you have the same mind of Christ, we have the same mind. And we are in agreement. And we will walk together in a straight, narrow path of righteousness. But I, I want to make it clear, and we have to understand this in light of what Paul wrote in Romans 14. We can differ over certain things. I was just going to... Okay? I mean, you may think that black pants are nicer than khaki pants. Or, I mean, there we don't. We're, that's not what we're talking about here, right? It's it's only God's word that we have to be in agreement. Well, no, it's only the gospel that we have to be in agreement. I mean, this is yeah. this. There is a foundation, and that is the gospel. So, read Romans fourteen. No, pray Romans fourteen. Seek God's understanding for the fullness of that. Romans chapter fourteen. But let me make this clear that Paul wrote that, but he also wrote that we have to be in agreement about what the gospel that he re was revealed to Paul, and he said it was of first importance. Mm -hmm. We have to be in agreement about the gospel. So let me read that to you, all right? 1 Corinthians 15, I'm going to read verses 3 to 8. Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom re remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. We need to believe in the revelation of God in the scriptures, the gospel. Well, is that important? Let me tell you what he wrote to the Galatians. But even, if, this is Paul writing, he says, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, this one, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be Accursed. Galatians 1, 8 through 9. That's serious stuff. Very serious. Very serious. And that's why it's so important to hear this command of God through John. In first, first, first letter of John 4, 1. And I'm paraphrasing, but it says, Test the spirits, for many false prophets have gone abroad. You better be testing what you're hearing. Okay? Mm -hmm. Making sure that what you're hearing is the word of God. Okay. Zipping right along. Mm -hmm. Amos, I'm going to read now, I'm going to read a bunch of verses. Amos chapter 3, still there, mm -hmm. verses 4 through 7. Okay. Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Does a young lion growl from his den unless he has captured something? Does a bird fall into a trap on the ground when there's no bait in it? Does a trap spring up from the earth when it captures nothing at all? 
If a trumpet is blown in a city, will it will not the people tremble? If a calamity occurs in a city, has not the Lord done it? Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. These are what's known as rhetorical questions. Mm -hmm. Okay? He's not looking for you to answer it. This is a rhetorical. Obviously, this is the truth, right? So the principal point here is to expose the leaders, the priesthood, so to speak, of these religions, or even false teachers, and the false prophets in the true faith, which is why he's saying it to in Israel, mm -hmm. who would have you believe that our God is a God who hides things from his people rather than being a God of revelation. You got that? Yes. Okay. He wants you to know. God God reveals himself. And he, he's not hiding things. The primary reason that people do that is that those people would have you think that the Lord keeps truth from the common people. That gives them the ability to control the flow of the things of God, his truth and his blessings. And that would give them power over people which can feed their pride and line their pockets. And it's generally both. God is no respecter of men. We are now, as Peter said, we're all that royal priesthood, each able to go directly with confidence before the Father because of the work of our intercessor and high priest, Jesus Christ. We can go directly in the name of Jesus, with Jesus, we can go directly to the Father. The concept of that priesthood that stands between you and God, and that you have to go through that man to get to God, that, no, there's only one intercessor between God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus. Okay? I don't know if you would, already said this, <clears throat> But I had a note for Deuteronomy twenty nine twenty nine that it says the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of this law. Amen. God is God is a God of revelation. Absolutely. He brings things to light, right? There is one of the churches in uh, the book of Revelation, and it specifically says something against that. Well, absolutely. It does. I mean, that, that's what he talks about when he's talking about in those seven letters to the seven churches, mm -hmm. the Nicolaitans. Yes. Nicolaitans were a, a, a class of people who would indeed stand between, wanted to stand between the people and God, right? It just doesn't work that way. No. All right? So re remember the, the reason that God reveals his secret counsel to his prophets is because they are his spokesmen right. called and empowered to pass on that revelation to his people. Mm -hmm. Who was that guy in the book of Acts, right? At the um, where he, uh, I think Philip was preaching to him, and he said he wanted to buy things from the Holy Spirit. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, that, 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 that was, uh, that was the, uh, that was Simon the magician. Yeah. 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 And you don't want to keep thing, if God tells you to speak, you want to speak it for free. Ask Jonah about that one. Well, well no, freely, freely you receive, receive, freely you give. Right, okay. Yeah. So let me just, I just want to touch on a couple of points on those verses, though, okay? Mm -hmm. He said, does a bird fall into a trap on the ground when there's no bait? For a trap to be effective, it has to have bait. Right. And the bait has to be attractive to the prey. Mm -hmm. Remember that as you're walking the straight and narrow. Satan can't come and bonk you on the head and knock you off. No. He has to try and entice you to leave that path of righteousness. Mm -hmm. So he baits traps. What does he bait traps with? What's attractive to you? What How does he know what's attractive to you? Because we mouth it. We talk all the time. Oh, I wish I had a new this. Oh, I wish I had. You know, that's what the trap's going to be. But if your desire is set upon the Lord, he can't take you up because you're on the path that leads to the Lord. Just something to think about. And then he says, if a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people crumble? Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm. The people today, the people of God, should be trembling. Yes. Because the alarm is being sounded. These are perilous, perilous last days. Now, you're going to really like this one. You'll probably turn me off and never see me again. Oh, if wow. calamity occurs in the city, has the Lord not done it? Absolutely. 
Do you believe the Word of God? Yes. How do you apply this to, to New Orleans? How do you apply this to 9-11 in New York City? Does God bring calamity? Yes. This is not just an Old Testament verse. This is the unchangeable Word of God. I said, woe to the Marcionites. The Marcionites were an early heresy. He was a, a, a teacher um, in started in the late first century going into it, but he started something, a, a heresy around the year 141, where he declared, he was teaching, that the God of the Old Testament was a different God than the God of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So he believed that the Hebrew Bible was, meaning the Old Testament, was not of God. He believed that only Paul was an apostle of God mm -hmm. because he was saying that God in the Old Testament is too harsh. Oh, Let me tell you something. It says in that, in that Old Testament, God is not a man that he should change. And it says in the New Testament that Jesus Christ, the Lord of God Almighty, is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. I often use the example that's available in Scripture to pursue understanding. Jesus Christ was coming out of the temple with, and coming out with his disciples, and I mean, I'm going to read you John 9, verses 1 and 3. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Jesus answered, It was neither this that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. What a wonderful answer. Once again, to God be the glory. Mm -hmm. However, if it wasn't the sin of the blind man or the sin of his parents, and now we know the purpose, let's go to the Word to discover the source. Mm -hmm. On a day whose record will live for all time, when an old Hebrew shepherd was drawn to a burning bush out in the wilderness, this conversation took place as the Lord called him to his ministry. Exodus 4, 10 and 11. Then Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in times past nor since. Thou hast spoken to thy servant, for I am slow of speech, slow of tongue. And the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him dumb or deaf? Or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Want to know why he was blind? God made him blind. Why? So that he could display his works and be glorified. Mm -hmm. Our response to that must be what the reply of Jesus was when it pleased the Father to crush him, mm -hmm. putting him to grief. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, Not my will, but thy will be done. That has to be our answer to the Lord. Not my will, thy will be done. Well, it, it's going to get a little tougher than that when we come back next week to continue on from here. And please be back. And until then, Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the word that you have spoken for us, Lord God. A tool to mold us and shape us into the image of your son, Christ Jesus. We praise you and thank you for your word and your work in our lives. For you are the potter and we are the clay. We are the sheep of your pasture. Well, until next week, may the Lord our God bless you and use you for the glory of his name. Bye-bye. So I cherish that old rugged cross Till my trophies are the best I Yeah.